and we'll introduce it and get underway. Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group at our September general meeting. We have uh, quite a crowd here tonight and a, a bit of a special treat. A few of our members I know have been playing with uh, 3D printing for a while, and in particular, I know Scott's uh, been a fairly early adopter and has figured out at least one way to get into this fascinating corner of the hobby. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Testy, VK5TST, to talk to us all about 3D printing. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Do I need to? Okay. Yep. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, so yeah, Grant asked me to put together a bit of a talk on 3D printing. I got into 3D printing about two and a half years ago probably spent the last year after I moved house not using it for a lot. So really only looking at about 18 months worth of experience uh, on this. But I thought I'd give a bit of a talk from my point of view, because for the you can spend years or you can spend hours, but we'll try and get away with spending half an hour or so talking about it and see what people think. Uh, so yeah, this is just one way to get started. And what I'd like to say is it's a hobby for me. It's not my business. Uh, the first time I saw a 3D printer was probably about 15 years ago at work. I was up in Queensland. And there was a laser company. They had a half a million dollar laser sintering 3D printer that seemed impressive. And that was the first time I'd sort of heard of this sort of technology. Kept an eye on it for a little while. Uh, but from my point of view, it was not what I wanted to get into at that time. I didn't have a hobby. Uh, but we'll go through my experiences as a hobby, talk about some of the basics. I'm only going to talk about the uh, filament based 3D printing. Uh, there's other technologies and other ways, but I don't know anything about those to really put any good comments down. Uh, go through just some of the basics of the process and what you've got to get to get started, some of the equipment, and uh, a few slides on some tips and tricks and stuff like that. And there was a box of some stuff going around and there's a few more bits and pieces I've got uh, if people want to have a look at things afterwards. Uh, and lastly, there's some Obviously, internet these days is full of amazing references for everybody. Uh, but yeah, I want to be aware or really solid. This is my experiences for what I was trying to get out of it. For me, it's a hobby, but my hobby is I want to design and print things. If I want a case for something, I want to solve a problem. I didn't want to develop a 3D printer. I didn't want to build my own from scratch, write software, debug the thing and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of people who do amazing stuff in that part of the hobby. And uh, I don't really know a lot about that. Whereas there's all these people optimizing drivers for stepper motors and changing gearing systems and uh, tweaking all that sort of stuff. I wanted a tool. So I just wanted to be able to design stuff and print it uh, and not spend too much time uh, messing around with it. And over the last 10 years, the hobby at the affordable price that we can get into it has gotten to that point where you can go to the shop, buy a printer, start printing. It won't be uh, error free. It won't be without hassles. Don't believe that the marketing that you can just buy a printer and start churning out large amounts of things, things will fail, things will stuff up and you will have to fix your printer, but uh, it's pretty developed. And there's some really low end, uh, budget printers on the on the market, uh, kits coming out of China, Alibaba and stuff like that. You can get a 3D printer for $150, $200 worth of parts. Uh, maybe that's going to be a little bit developmental. Uh, I guess getting into the terminology first, if you're talking 3D printing or the buzzword is additive manufacturing, uh, yeah, the main two types are the filament based and the resin based. So whether they call it fused filament fabrication or fused deposition modeling, they're just the two names. FDM is a trademark of one of the companies about 20 years ago that started the filament based printing and they've trademarked it. So everybody who's in the open source and not that company calls it fused filament fabrication, but it's just printing with a filament and I should have brought a roll along with me. Uh, the other type is a resin based thing. So it's a 
plastic resin that's a liquid and then you shine a UV light or a laser onto it and it solidifies. And so in that case, you uh, do it through a stereolithography uh, device, uh, whether it's an LCD panel or a laser scanning and it actually solidifies the plastic. It's really good for fine detail stuff, but uh, quite a bit more expensive on the consumables is my understanding. Uh, I've only been using the 3D filament stuff. So basically you've got a roll of plastic filament. It's about 1.75 millimeters in diameter and it gets melted and extruded through a nozzle that's then squirted like a toothpaste tube onto a flatbed. And that's how you build up the model by progressively going backwards and forwards and around and around. Uh, how they choose to make the head move across the platform, different mod printers use different models. We've got a couple at work. The head stays at the top and the bot and the platform moves up and down. Mine, the, the platform stays at the bottom and the head moves left and right and up, uh, moves left and right and up and down and the platform moves forwards and backwards. Uh, and it's a 3D process with a fourth uh, movement, which is the rate at which you squirt the plastic out through the system. So it's in some respects, yeah, there's four controls that you've got on there, which is why if you have a look at say the printers here, uh, the one on the left is the, the model that I've got. Uh, so this platform moves forwards and backwards, the head moves backwards and forwards that way and up and down on screwed threads. Uh, there's another model over there where the platform moves from the top down and the head stays in the same plane. Uh, and this is sort of what an extruder looks like. So the plastic comes through here, goes through all these connections. There's a, a collection of cogs that basically grips the plastic and forces it through. And then there's the hot end down there that melts the plastic and squirts it through the nozzle. Uh, so that's kind of the basics of how a filament 3D printer works. There's a whole bunch of design decisions over where the motors sit, where they will go. They don't really make a, a big difference to the fundamentals of it. Although I'm sure there's religious debates on websites over whether a Bowen system like on the left-hand side where the filament's cranked from outside the box in or whether it's uh, done direct drive at the head is a th system, I don't really know. Uh, I've only bought one printer and I'm happy with what I've got. I couldn't tell you whether the other stuff works better. Uh, in terms of the basic process, you start with doing some designing and that is creating your 3D model in a CAD tool. And you'd normally export that model in some kind of thing. The formats I've used are STL and OBJ files. I'm not really sure what STL stands for. I'm gonna pretend. You then input that into a tool called a slicer, which turns that model and decides for your printer how to send that into a bunch of commands to move the head around. And the output of that is a file format generally called G code that is full of some instructions. So if we have a look, here's a 3D CAD tool. Uh, this is a really simple one I use called Tinkercad. It's free, it's done by the same people who do AutoCAD and you run it in a web browser. Uh, you will, I'll, do a quick demo later, but it's really simple to use. If your goal is to do solid objects with holes punched through them and you wanna add blocks on top of blocks and do things like that, which for all the stuff I've wanted to do, building boxes, that sort of stuff, it's done what I wanna do for design. Uh, there are more advanced tools, but I haven't got around to that part of the hobby of using some of those more advanced tools. Then once you take that model and you export it out and you put it into the slicer, and at this point here, it starts setting it up for your printer. And so you import the model and you can actually put multiple models down on the printer to be printed at the same time. And then you slice them and it actually goes through and starts deciding which parts are gonna be infill, which parts are going to be the surface layers and that sort of stuff. I'll show a bit of a quick demo later. And then you get the G code, which is sort of full of these commands here. Here's the sort of setup thing where you're setting the temperatures, the feed rates, the size of everything. And then over on the right hand side, there's a bunch of X, Y, Z movements and extrusion rates. So as I said, you've got four dimensions or four sets of data to move in three dimensions plus extrude. In terms of the tools, I use Tinkercad. I bought a Prusa printer. So I use the Prusa slicer and then I use the G code that comes out of that. Uh, I'll just quickly switch across to... So this is Tinkercad. As I said, it's a free one. You just sign up with your email address, 
or an account through one of the services. Oops, that is not. Okay, so this is Tinkercad. Uh, uh, so if we look at an example here, uh, and just to be aware, this, is, this laptop has no GPU in it. It's running over a mobile network. I don't have fast internet at home. It does run slow in Chrome if you don't have hardware acceleration, but with basic onboard video, it works fine. And as you can see, uh, you can rotate the object around. I've actually got this, the, the unit that this was done from. This is a box that's supposed to have a Raspberry Pi mounted in the front of it there and a little power supply board in there. And it's designed to stack on top of other boxes. And you would take that object. Uh, and when you're doing the modeling in there, I could grab, zoom in, and I could grab that. You basically put down items that are either solid or holes, and then you move them around. So if I just wanted to move that hole over there, I'll move it over there, move the standoff, oops, undo. Move the standoff over there with it. And now it's probably got to change the, the grid size. And now I've moved that standoff to that location there. That's as simple as it is. I'm not a CAD person. We've got people at work, mechanical engineers who have trained for years to do AutoCAD. They can probably do a lot of fancy stuff. I can do some simple stuff. And then again, you're building up your picture by basically dropping on different objects. Uh, I put a little uh, lip on the top of here because this one stacks on top of another one. So they stack inside each other and nest. And it's just dropping lots and lots of polygon shapes on top of one another and you get a whole model out of the whole thing. Uh, what you then do is export that file and say that you want it as a STL model. It's downloaded it and then I go into my slicer program. Now the slicer is specific to the tool that you're using. I go import STL file. That was the one I downloaded. And now it's placed it there on my plat platter. So as I showed on the printer, it's got the sheet on the bottom or the printing bed that it prints on. I can choose to move that down to the corner. It will tell me if it goes outside the box. Uh, I can place it upside down. I can even go and tell it I want to turn it onto its side, print it that way. Why I would, that would be a horrible way to try and print something like that, but I can print it that way. Uh, the great part about this is you can import multiple items and do them as one print job if you need to do, which can work really well for some uh, setups. Uh, then I've got all the control settings that you have in here, and I pick what type of material I want to print, what quality level from 0.05 millimeter detail to sort of high speed 0.3 millimeter draft. Uh, and as an example, if we start at 0.5 millimeter and I tell it to slice now, it now shows me all the layer detail that it's doing. I can even scroll down through that and see the print as it would come up through the layers and the different type, the color shows whether it's a base layer and a perimeter or a fill. There's all the different strengths on those things. Uh, that comes up there, but it's telling me that that would take, I don't know if people can read the writing down, down the bottom there. That's one day, 12 hours and 51 minutes to print. But if I was to say change that, say I want to do it in a 0.2 millimeter high speed thing, so extrude the plastic faster, a larger tube of plastic comes out, I won't have the fine detail. Uh, it will cause things like the holes to be a slightly different size because of the less tolerance. I'll tell it to slice that now. It tells me that that's five hours and 26 minutes. So it's that trade off between time and quality of how you want to do it in that process. And then if I was to export that G-code, let's bring up. Just open the notepad. You can see that it's full of all those commands and it's thousands of lines. Now in the process, you then got to get that onto the printer. With the printer I've got, I put that on an SD card, walk over, put it in the printer, set it up. I could. You can also get printers that have got USB cables hooking directly up to the computer. That doesn't work for me. It's on the other side of the room. You can get wireless adapters to put on the printers. How you get it on there really is specific to the printer that you've bought. Let's continue. 
Now, one thing to be really careful about with this is that the G code is very specific. It needs to know the model of printer you've got, the type of filament you're using, everything. And the G code language itself has no protection. If your printer doesn't have protection, you can tell the G code could tell the printer to do bad things. Drive the head into the base, go outside the boundaries. If your printer doesn't have crash detection, you could burn out the printer, you could start a fire. Because it could just tell the printer to heat the head up to 300 degrees Celsius and just start squirting out ink, uh, squirting out the plastic, and it will do that. If the printer doesn't have protection, a good printer will detect that that's bad stuff. But what it says is you probably don't want to be downloading a G-code file directly off the internet unless you know the person, you can trust them, and they've got the same printer as you. If they've got a different printer, if they're using a different plastic brand of plastic or a different type of plastic, they may have generated the G-code file for a printer running plastic that needs to be 30, 40 degrees hotter than yours needs to be, and it'll go bad, and there's a whole bunch of tuning. So generally, you would download the model from the CAD tool and then slice it for your own printer for how you want to print it. Uh, in terms of getting started, what I'd suggest you want to do is work out what type of printer you want to get. So do you want to print large items? Do you want to print small items? And what materials you want to use? Because different printers can't print different types of filament. Uh, you probably want to choose a CAD tool. I'd start with a cheap free one and work from there. Uh, Tinkercad's very rudimentary, it's simplistic. It can't do the advanced stuff, but I haven't outgrown it yet. I'm probably getting close on some of the things. I think Fusion 360 is probably what I'm gonna try next. Uh, if you're into more creative stuff, there's tools like Blender that are more organic shapes. So you're not gonna design a, a box for an electronics project, but you might design a, uh, a piece of, costume jewelry or something like that in that if that was your goal if you're trying to make an ornament or something like that with lots of curved surfaces and, and different textures uh, and you're going to have to fiddle around a bit uh, when it comes to picking a printer you've got a range of options you can go down to jcar buy a printer you can go online buy a printer there's lots of commercial printers that are pretty proprietary but they work out of the box they've got a kit uh, or you can go to a commercial open source thing. So a lot of the open source projects have been commercialized and that's the, the printer I've got is a Prusa printer. Come, everything is open source, but they sell it as a kit or pre-assembled for you. Uh, you can go open source uh, and do it yourself. Or if you're really crazy, you can start from scratch and, and start building your own circuit boards from scratch, write your own software and do everything. Right? What I would suggest is that if you're going down one of the options of the commercial open source, it's not a bad idea to buy it as a kit because you will need to repair it. The plastic, you've got molten plastic squirting around in places, things will jam up, things will slip, a bearing will need to be tightened, something will go wrong. It isn't a perfect system. You will have to occasionally finesse your system. And if you spent the sort of Sunday afternoon putting the printer together, You've got a pretty good idea of how the printer goes together and it makes it a little easier to do some of that maintenance uh, but that said you can still get a kit with really good support uh, the printer i went for was it's a prusa i3 mark three so it's a made in the czech republic by a guy named joseph prusa he started on the reprap project which is an open source one and he was building his own versions of those and people like them, so he started making them as kits. And he's over the last uh, almost a decade been making a lot of printers. I think he's now sold about 500,000 of these printers. Uh, price wise, they're about uh, $1,000 as a kit in Australia. So I think they're $750 US as a kit or $1,000 pre assembled. Uh, I bought mine through a guy up in Queensland who brings them in and provides in-country support for them. He'll either buy the kit and assemble it for you, or he'll sell you the kit and he'll also sell you tools and accessories and he keeps a range of spare parts as well. Uh, and to be honest, I think you'd probably save $50 if you went to the hassle of buying it direct from the Czech Republic and doing the import and the customs and all that sort of stuff. 
and with the GST rules these days, I'm happy to pay a guy who's uh, really not charging too much. And if you go to his site, he, his business is he prints 3D parts for four-wheel drive accessories, roof rack adapters and kits and things like that. Uh, it's got automatic bed leveling. That was something. So when I started with this, I'd had a look around. I started looking at, hey, I can get a 3D printer for $300 from JCAR. This would be a lot of fun. And then I started reading up and everybody goes, yeah, but you can only buy one brand of filament from JCAR. It's expensive to run. Maybe you want to buy something better. Then I was looking at other things. Then I was looking at $3,000 printers on websites and bits and pieces from like the Ultimakers and stuff like that. And I had a chat to one of the guys at work and he said, this is the kit that most of the Chinese knockoffs copy. He said, but they give you good support and all of their software is there. And there's a whole bunch of community out there with really good support to tell you how to use it. And they generally do some of the more advanced features. Uh, so the, le the bed gets automatically leveled. If things aren't in alignment, it will actually correct for that as part of a uh, kickoff activity. It'll self measure how the bed is aligned and compensate for that. Uh, it's got a heated bed, which means that the plastic will adhere to it better when you're printing that first layer. And first layer adhesion is generally the bane of getting started on these things. Uh, and the other part is, is you once you've printed it and you've got the adhesion to the bed, you've then got to get your print off the bed without ruining it. And one of the nice things they have on theirs is they have a magnetic bed with a spring steel sheet on the top of it. So you flip that off and then you bend the sheet and it just pops off like a baking tray. It's a really clever idea and they do do not quite nicely. So it's not the cheapest option. I would say there's things like the Creality Ender series, make some similar printers for probably half the money. Uh, and they're well supported as well with a large community on them. But uh, I just sort of went for something that a few people I knew recommended. And I wasn't interested in sort of saving that last couple of hundred dollars if it meant that it was going to be more fiddling around. Because as I said, I wanted a tool out of this, not so much a hobby to experiment and debug a printer. Uh, the other question you're going to decide, which also will come into picking what type of printer you want, is what type of filament you want to use. And there's a whole range of different filaments. They're all different plastic uh, compositions, and most of them are also proprietary to the companies that make them, but the printers will handle a range of them. And it's how much strength you want, whether you need UV stability, whether you need it to be resistant to chemical solvents or food safe. Uh, you can even get food safe nozzles for the printers so that everything you print is considered food safe. Uh, some plastics are easier to print with than others. They're very accommodating over the temperature and the speed of extrusion. Others are really fit, fiddly to get right and they'll go really stringy or they'll go blobby when they're trying to print. There's a few of the plastics that generate toxic fumes when they're printing. ABS is one of those. It does generate gases and you probably wouldn't want to do that in an enclosed room without ventilation. Uh, and some of the filaments are quite abrasive, so they will wear out the nozzle on your printer, uh, especially with the additives. One of the ones things I've got here uh, has little bits of steel in it to give it a metallic finish. It comes out looking like it's printed out of sort of a bit of a burnished bronze. Uh, I wouldn't want to be printing that all day, every day, unless I was willing to replace nozzles on the printer fairly regularly. But it's fun for the odd project. Uh, I will warn you that if you sort of decide to do things on the fun side, you will end up buying like 20 rolls of filament to have one of every color and a bunch of different finishes. And then you realize that actually you're mostly just printing boxes for things. So that's why I use the various different colors for draft prints like the green box, which wouldn't be what you'd normally do. Uh, the two main ones that people use these days is PLA uh, or polylactic acid. It's a good price. It's pretty easy to print with used to have a reputation for not being very stable because it's actually based on a plant material and some of the true PLAs are biodegradable. And so people go, they don't want them. The reality is almost every PLA you buy these days has something added to it. It's probably not as biodegradable as you'd like. If that was your goal of having a biodegradable plastic that your parts could be decomposted uh, later. Uh, but it also means that most of those parts don't wear out as much as you'd like. I've had parts sitting outside in the sun and they haven't sort of weakened in any way. 
And I mean, this little part here, I printed one of these once before, this has got some moving parts. I sat there with a pair of multi-grips trying to rip it apart and it took me 15 minutes to break it. It's actually surprising how strong some of this, and that's just the cheap PLA stuff, but it actually, it's, it's actually quite strong. Uh, PETG is the same pet you get out of uh, plastic bottles, but it's got some glycol in it to make it a little easier to print. Uh, it's a little more durable, it's a little more expensive, but it's still pretty easy to print. I would suggest that unless you have a special need, they're both plastics that are pretty easy to work with for a lot of projects. Uh, ABS and nylon, you can print, but often you need to have different settings. And if you swap between a lot of these materials, you have to really clean the machine out. And so that's why I stick to PET and PLA, because you can pretty much swap spools and go from one to the other without messing up your machine. Uh, ABS has the toxic fumes. One of the advantages of ABS though, is you can mist acetone over it afterwards and it will slightly dissolve the surface and give you a really smooth finish. So if that's your goal to get like glass finish on your, your prints, you might want to go down that path. Uh, nylon's apparently really tricky to print. And then there's some other exotics that have some amazing material properties. They've got a printer at work that prints nylon embedded with carbon fiber and it's stronger than steel. So they use that to print final parts rather than they used to have a printer that printed ABS and they'd print prototype parts out of them and then send them off to get the real parts made. That one they can actually print final parts out of. You don't need too many tools. You'll need a nice pair of nippers, which probably everybody here's already got uh, because you're gonna need to cut filament with a nice finish. A small wire brush because there will be plastic squirted in bad places and you're gonna to need to scrub it off the head. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to clean up your prints with a scalpel. Uh, calipers are not useful for when you're doing design and some isopropyl alcohol and a paper towel for cleaning the bed is about all I use. You need to put the printer somewhere that's stable and flat. You don't want it on a bouncy card table. You don't want it uh, somewhere that's uneven. Uh, you'd like it clear of obstructions and no flammable stuff. You don't want it that as the printer's moving backwards and forwards, particularly if you've got some of the kits that are an exposed frame, you've got cables out the side. You don't want the head to bang into a pile of books that you've got sitting next to the printer. So a little bit of clear space around it is nice. You don't want flammables nearby. It is two or 300 degrees at the hot end. And if those nice light curtains blow across the printer, <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, you don't want wind or breeze because that will cool the printer, gives you, doesn't give you the temperature control that you'd like and could even blow the item over. Some of those prints are quite light and there's don't have a lot holding them down. A good gust of wind could blow them over while they're in the middle of being printed. Uh, they do make some noise. They're not quiet, they're not silent, probably not gonna go well in your bedroom if you share it with somebody. <laughs> uh, an office at the other end of the uh, room, amateurs probably have a shack, so that's probably not a bad location because the radios have already been banned from the peace and quiet at the house. Uh, and if you're printing with uh, filaments that are toxic, you're obviously gonna need some ventilation. When I first built mine, I built this cabinet to put it inside. Uh, in fact, all the little catches are magnetic so that if the printer was to hit them for any reason, they just pop out on the side. They're all just made out of thin sheets of uh, clear core flute and they all pop out and I put some LEDs in them, put a clear cover on the front, even mounted a smoke detector in there because when I first got it, I was paranoid. I thought if something's gonna go and set off while I'm in the other end of the house, watching TV, I wanna know about it. Uh, I don't use that anymore actually, because when I've moved house, I don't have room for it to sit on a big desk like it did. So at the moment it's sitting out in the open. Uh, but all the little catches with the magnetic things were one of the first things I printed was these little magnetic captive catches uh, to put in stuff. Uh, in terms of some uh, tips and tricks, molten plastic is hot. It hurts. <laughs> And the metal parts that are melting it are hot as well. And it's, they call the bottom end, the hot end, where it melts the plastic for a good reason. You also, also wanna watch the first layer. 
and maybe even a couple of others. If you're not getting clean extru ex extrusion of the plastic and you're not getting good bed adhesion on the first layer, there's always a risk that the print is gonna fail. The one on the right-hand side there, that was actually on about the third or fourth layer and it, de and it actually came loose and the entire piece of plastic started moving around with the head as it was trying to print on the, on the bed. And that blob of plastic was completely covering the hot end. And that was in about 10, 15 minutes of unattended use because it had started lifting. And about five prints later from that one, I'm still having the odd glob of blue, clear blue plastic drop onto a print after I thought I'd completely cleaned the head. I luckily didn't have to disassemble it, but it's yeah, made life miserable on that one. Uh, and that I think I've stopped starting, stopped using that plastic at the moment until I can work out what my settings are to make that work. Uh, with that, I'd say tuning your settings is easier if you stick to a filament you can trust or at least a brand. And that I think is one of the problems I have with, I went out and bought 20 different filaments and all these different colors. I did buy them mostly from one company, uh, but I found that even the, the different color additives would change how they'd behave. So the blue plastic and the green plastic were printing fine, but the yellow plastic didn't print. And I had so many failed prints with that one that I stopped using it. Uh, but between the different brands, you just need to know what they are. And again, you go back into your slicer and you can change your settings. Some of the well-known brands, the slicer knows about them and you say, it's this brand of filament and it'll work. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of tuning of your settings, but once you've got them, you can generally reliably print on them, but I'd still suggest that 10% of the time something goes wrong and your print fails. Uh, and the other thing is, is that filaments can absorb moisture and change their behavior over time. Uh, the extruder, it's fragile. Basically at the bottom, you've got a two to 300 degree hot part. And at the at higher up, you've got a motor that has to grip hold of solid plastic and push it through. So you've got this very fine heat sink in the middle. Uh, it's well supported while it's on the printer, but when you're moving it around and working on it, it is a bit delicate. And the nozzles at the bottom that you can see right at the bottom there, uh, are actually screwed in there an M6 fitting and they're screwed in while it is at about 200 degrees. So as it cools, you would not be able to remove it without cracking the, the hot end. So if you're doing something with, a, with the hot end, just be careful on those ones. Uh, batch printing parts is a really good way of getting through the process a lot quicker because every time you print one, you've got to clean the bed, you've got to load it up. And if it only takes 10 minutes, you're going to spend all your time sitting there watching it. So sometimes you can do a whole lot of them. The downside is that if one of them fails, you might lose the entire batch. Uh, so it's that balance between, I wouldn't normally say I've printed, uh, what's that, 18 items or whatever there. I would have maybe printed half a dozen at a time and accepted half hour print jobs rather than trying to go for five minutes or two hours, go somewhere in between. If you just get a bit of stringing on one print, you've generally just had one out of the batch fail. But if one of them has adhesion problems, it starts moving around and knocking everything else around and the big blue ball of pain. <laughs> uh, when you're placing things, there'd be the orientation of certain things. Peter 5KX would recognize this because this was a part for his lathe I printed for him. Uh, but obviously certain parts would have a particular way that they sit better on the printer. Asking the uh, filament to dangle in space is not gonna work. It has to build on something below it. You can bridge out at an angle, you can build small holes, uh, or you can get it to build support where it'll actually print a really fine layer of disposable plastic that you'll cut away from it afterwards uh, and it will look fine. The other part to look at is the stress forces. It is a layered approach and logically, there are some angles at which it can handle more stress for being pulled apart or shearing on that sort of level there. But I have to admit, I've been really surprised at how much strength there is between the layers and most good printouts don't have a, I don't have a problem with them pulling apart on the layers. And if you're doing quick draft prints, you will sacrifice some quality for speed. Uh, the easiest way is to change the layer thickness that gets you in there fairly quick. Uh, you can change the infill and the perimeters. So you can actually change how many times it goes around the outside of a circular part or a, or a hole uh, and add more strength to that. That can also help. 
and you can change the level of infill. So most of these things that you print out are not 100% solid. They're actually a lattice work on the inside to keep it a little empty uh, and it saves you money. The less plastic you're using, the less time you're spending because generally the weight goes up, the time goes up, the cost goes up uh, and the software will tell you how much you, you're using. Uh, but one thing to be aware of is it does slightly change the fit of parts. So if you're going for a really snug fit on an axle or something like that in a part, then the thing might change. Uh, one of the things I printed was actually a uh, hole template where I've got all the holes from one millimeter to 13 millimeters so that I can actually go there with an M3 bolt and find that while you would have thought that maybe a three millimeter hole is the right size to put in a piece to put pass an M3 nut, uh, screw through, that actually making it 3.25 is a better fit. Uh, so just those little things that, that make it a little easier. Uh, in terms of references, uh, there's a couple of good YouTube channels. Uh, Makers Mark, Angus is a guy in Australia. He does some really good stuff on just general advice. Uh, Thomas has got a good website as well. And CNC Kitchen, they also do some really good tests where they'll start printing a whole bunch of different materials or different structures. And then they'll do destructive stress tests on them and measure uh, how much force it took to break something or things like that. Uh, the websites, I bought mine from Prusa, uh, or I bought the Prusa printer and came from their site, but I actually bought it from S3DP, which is the guy up in Queensland. Uh, 3D Phillies is where I bought my uh, filament from, and Thingiverse is a site you can go to to download models. So some of the sort of the dragons and the random bits and pieces of models that I've had passed around uh, came from there that aren't sort of so structurally designed. Uh, I'm not saying that you couldn't, uh, there's plenty of other printers and this is not saying that this is the best printer to buy. It's the one that I bought two years ago. They're still going strong. I'm, I'm happy with it. And I'd say that if you're looking to get into the hobby for around the $1,500 mark, it's a good option. There are plenty of good options. I would say at half that price too. Uh, I don't know anything about the options at higher prices. Uh, do I have any regrets? It mostly works well. Uh, I stuck this one on the printer uh, last night and it came off first go. It came off the printer and it moves. It's a moving part straight off the printer uh, with nested pieces inside each other. Uh, and it looks pretty neat. It's probably not a perfect fit. Theo will probably look at it and go, my layers aren't right or something like that. But it's functional. And for me, I mostly print functional stuff. I'm not into creative stuff so much but I've printed boxes for projects. Uh, I needed a, a box to put a tool in. Uh, one of the first things I printed was my table saw at home had the wrong size fitting and it was some weird Ryobi size that didn't fit any of my dust extraction systems. So I custom printed a uh, adapter to be able to fit my four inch dust, dust extraction onto my table saw. Uh, it took half an hour or so to print and it came out nicely and did the job. Is it neat and tidy? No, it's probably ugly. You wouldn't sell it, but it does the job. And two years on, it still hasn't broken. Uh, so yeah, it can be frustrating at times, especially when you think you're just going to get one done and then have layer adhesion problems for four prints in a row. And then the next one works perfectly. But I'd say the, uh, the capability and the convenience to be able to print a project yourself, to be able to get that nice finish, the holes where you need it and it, adjust it it's actually worth it if that's what you want to do uh, any questions hey where are we can you hear us you can good do we have any questions first of all from the floor here at eric yes kim um, have you any recommendations for materials that are going to be good outside in the weather in the UV? Uh, I haven't done a lot of testing with that. Uh, supposedly PETG is good UV stable and outdoors. But as I said, I've actually been quite surprised at how some of the PLA materials I've used. Uh, one of the ones that's in the kit is got a horse on it. it was printed to be a bridle strap hook to go outside on a property. And I did hang that one up outside 
for over winter for about three or four months with a house brick hanging off of it to see how it would handle the weight. Uh, and it did fine. And then I had to move house, so it's been inside since then. So uh, I was actually, yeah, surprised that that's just the, the cheap material and it survived quite well. Uh, I haven't, there are, again, there's people out there who've done tests where they put stuff out there, but PETG is supposed to be very good for UV stable and outdoor long life. Okay, do you have another question? Let's put a hand up over here somewhere. Yep, Jared. Yeah, good evening, Scott. Um, I just wondered um, if there's printers which uh, have more than one nozzle, so basically more than one filament loaded sim simultaneously, and whether you've had any experience or have some knowledge of those. I did actually look at that because the printer I've got has a uh, multi-material upgrade on it. It doesn't have uh, more than one. It doesn't have multiple nozzles. It has one nozzle and then a switching unit that sits on top of it. that can take up to eight, up to five different filaments and then switch between them. Uh, the downside is that you have to, every time you change filament, you have to purge the filament that you've got in there as part of that process. I think if you had a multi multi nozzle head, you'd have alignment issues with the spacing of them, unless it was a very good printer. But the ones I looked at could swap the filament on the fly without any human interaction. It's a little motorized uh, switching unit that routes different filaments in. Uh, you end up having to purge a lot of plastic every layer every time you change colors. And I looked at that and said, that's a nice $500 upgrade, but I probably don't want to go. In most cases, the purge block is about three times the weight in plastic of the item you're printing. Uh, so I looked at that and said, yeah, for structural parts, which is what I want to print. If you were more creative, then yeah, there's some people out there printing some beautiful multicolored items that, uh, and that works really well. Uh, I've instead printed different colors and then glued them together with super glue. That costs. Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes, Mark. Trot over the other side. <laughs> Just wondering, do uh, does the do they make for that printer a different uh, different heads? Like that's a a film a head for printing, like a laser head for doing uh, using the same three D. Uh, uh, not on not on that one. There are some of the I think there are some models mm -hmm. that can also replace the the printing head with a milling head or a drilling mm -hmm. head. Uh, mm -hmm. There's I've had no experience with any of those. Uh, Can't do it with that machine. Not with that machine, no. They're just in the 3D printing space. Uh, there's, uh, if you start watching YouTube, there's some amazing printers. One of the ones I saw that's quite interesting is it's actually a 3D printer that prints in mm. a cylindrical uh, axis. So the bed is actually a cylinder and then it prints by almost like a la reverse lathe. It spins the cylinder around and moves backwards and forwards and deposits on there. And they use that to print uh, gears and product uh, items that want to be circular because at that point, then the layer of the angles is in a particular location for how they want to do the part. Thanks. Okay, anybody else here on the floor, first of all? Otherwise, do we have anybody on uh, Zoom for AREG members who'd also like to ask any questions? Sorry, did I miss a hand? <laughs> No. Okay, Hayden, I don't know if there's any questions on the uh, YouTube side as well. We'll take those as well. Uh, nothing on YouTube, but just plenty of comments from uh, a lot of people interested and, and a few 3D printing nuts in the, uh, in the chat. Fair enough. Not a problem. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, I'd like to uh, just say thank you very much, Scott, for uh, taking the time to put the presentation together. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. And uh, we'll say goodnight to everybody on YouTube. And uh, the ARIG members stand by on the channel. We'll uh, break for a few minutes, and then we'll have our general meeting. So uh, get, get everybody to stretch your legs for a few minutes. <laughs>